<laughs> Sexy Mitch Chan. <clears throat> All right. We should be going live. Let's see. Is the stream live? It is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> you got the E fan badge. That's great. That's funny. I don't know how. I don't know how that got there, but it's there. All right, we are Fantastic. live. Um, we are. Let me just check that. You guys, can you see and hear if audio is coming out of? Yeah, it sounds like it is. It is. Yeah. Yep. Is. Sick. All right, we're live. You want to give us an intro, Mitch? <laughs> oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Coming at you live from the hotel bathroom and uh, from Billy Rennekamp's hotel bathroom. Whoa. I'm drinking from Billy Rennekamp's mini fridge and I'm wearing Billy Rennekamp's bathrobe. With me in spirit, virtually, Travis Smalley and Matt Shell. How you doing, fellas? Doing great, Mitch. Thank you for that uh, wonderful <laughs> introduction, and uh, and glad you could make it during your your international travels. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Wouldn't miss it for the world, you guys. Awesome. So I am actually. Whoop! I just realized that we we're missing our little logo image. Let me pop that up. I'm running the stream today, so any uh, any failures are all my own. Um, today is my video coming through on your? Uh, no, actually, it's not. I see no video for you. Well, let me stop it. I see, I see it video there. for you. I see video for you, but the um, uh, but the audience doesn't. Huh. Okay. Okay. Hold on. That might be on yeah, my side. You're, yeah. This could be. You're in, you're in Discord, but not on the stream. Video or something. Can yeah. You. That? You definitely silenced Travis. How? <laughs> how is that possible? This is like what you were doing to me last week, trying to trying to ban, yeah. cancel my excellent Death Stranding takes. Uh, <laughs> oh, disable video. Apparently, there we go. Here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Travis Smalley. Hey, there we go. Hello, hello. Awesome, awesome. Ready to blotro. All right, yeah, and we've got some art tab running in the background for now. Uh, while we do, I think we could do kind of quicker intro and get into the game. Um, yeah, let's do it. I hear we're playing Bellatro, and if there's one thing that has been a constant theme in my life the last two weeks is that I'm sick of not playing Bellatro. <laughs> fuck all this art shit. Let's get to it. Yeah, yeah. I want to watch this number go up. Hell's yes. So yeah, for those who don't know, I'll I'll put it up on this. I'll put the uh, title up on the screen. So. Um, the, no, nope, not the graphic. We're going to turn on the game, the game. Ooh, ah. Um, so yeah, Bellatro is a indie game that just came out maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, um, developed by a single developer whose name, who has a funny name, which is in the credits. Uh, what is it? Local Thunk. Shout out to Local Thunk. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of in the tradition of, I would say it's heavily inspired by Slay the Spire, which we also have queued up um, to take a quick look at, probably towards the tail end of the stream. And so it's a, a deck building roguelike. So it's inspired by um, deck building card games like Magic the Gathering, uh, and then roguelike games where you're playing kind of randomly generated runs and trying to kind of put together combinations of things. Like, I, I think for me, the great pleasure of these games comes from the kind of play with the combinatorics and trying to build crazy kind of unbalanced combos. Uh, Mitch, just before we started, you were gonna share a little bit about your, what, your, what was it, your 48 million point hand that you got? Yeah, and if you go go online and look on YouTube, like I mean, you you see you see hands and decks that are way better than this. But in two weeks of, of semi semi serious playing, yeah, my bet's also a high card run. Um, and like 
one of the things that you got to get out of your mind is that like no it's like 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 full houses aren't necessarily better than a pair right as you know like actually like if you build up your 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 high card power then just playing a single card will be the most powerful so i had i had one card that um, I had one card that added a plus one multiplier um, every time I discarded that hand. Mm. So I begin every round by just discarding a single card. Then boom, plus one multiplier. And by that I get high card up to like t- times 35 by the, by, by the end of my run. I have another card that will, um, that allows me to choose a card and then immediately make two copies and put them in my hand. Mm. So you do that to make sure that you always have steel cards so that by the end, like your hand is just full of steel cards that are giving you uh, whatever your multiplier is times another 1.5. So if that first joker got me up to, if my first joker got me up to times 35, then all those steel cards would get me up to like times 44, times 66, times 88, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. And then... I had another card that gives me a multiplier for how many steel cards I have in my deck. Ooh. Because I've used the previous card, my deck is full of steel cards. So then I'm typically getting another like times eight on top of that. And then crucially, there's a joker that always repeats the effect of the card to its right. And you can move it every time you play a card. So when I discard that first card, I'm actually getting boom, boom, two more multipliers. When I clone the card, I'm actually getting two more steel cards. And then when I get the steel card multiplier, I'm getting that twice. And I, so I'm ending up with hands that are worth like 48 million points. So you got to, you're obviously for, <clears throat> deeper into this than I am, Mitch. So you got to quote, you got you to coach me. You got to coach me through this next round. I've only got, like, Let's do it. I've only got like five hours into this game and actually nothing is unlocked on this computer. So we're really starting Great. from the very beginning. Um, oh, actually, hold on. This was a run that I was like mid run. Let me actually take, let me quit and take us back to, uh, let's do new run just so we can really start from the beginning. All right. So here we are. So this is like how it starts, right? You're beating these blinds, which is like the, you need to reach at least this score. So we'll start with a small blind and you're drawing cards and you're playing poker hands, right? So. You can sort by suit, so I've got four clubs, so maybe I could try to get a a flush, or we can sort by rank, and in this case, I've already got a, almost actually a straight flush, but I'm just gonna play it as a straight. And so here we can see, right, this is the multiplier, the red number, and then we have the blue number, which is the points value, which is gonna get added to by the cards that I play. So if I play this, we'll see that it's gonna rank each card. And then what we're trying to do is to get these 300 points in this number of hands with this many discards. So it's kind of like a race to get to a certain score in the, <clears throat> in the allotted number of hands. Um, so what would you guys do here? It looks like you almost got a flush. Yeah. Yeah, they're almost, well, Two cards away, yeah, one card away from a flush diamonds. Or I can yeah. play the pair of queens. Let's go for the flush. Let's try to get, let's dump some of these yeah. hearts. Yeah, just go the discard mechanic. And now you've got, it's, there you go. There you go. So I love the, this aspect of it that where you, you can make this very clear intent about what you're trying to do, right? It really doesn't feel random. And I think for like the higher level yeah. play, you keep it there for a second. Yeah, yeah. You have this table where you can see actually what cards are in your deck. And importantly, unlike a 52 card traditional deck of cards, you can add cards to your deck and take cards out of your deck. Right. So you're not limited to 52 cards. So I could keep buying aces and putting them into my deck and kind of try to do like an all aces strategy. Travis, yeah, it's, I think, yeah. yeah, I was, this is uh, one of the things both here, but also the run info where you, uh, the UI is giving you so much information to kind of base your decisions on, right. At all times, like where in here you can kind of see like, oh yeah, like I've, I've already ran through most of my spades, so I should not try to hope for a flush to happen next time. Or you can go into the, the run info to be like, okay, where are my 
multipliers at so that I know what to do, uh, what to do next. And when I'm seeing this with this kind of with your widescreen right now, I could also like just imagine that this information could be on the left and right hand side as well. Like that we would literally get all that information when we're playing. Um, but yeah, that, this was especially early on. I found myself coming here a lot to kind of see like what what's going on. What cards do I? What cards do I have? What multipliers do I have at the, right now? Yeah, and I think this is there's a really nice. And so, not, oh yeah, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah. Well, you, you start off in a really comfortable place with this information up up <clears throat> up on the screen. You see, we're basically playing poker, right? The straight flush is the best. The pair is the first high card is, is, is the actual actual worst. And one of the, the, the fun things about the game is is watching that hierarchy get perverted. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Where where you might have a full house, but it actually makes more sense for you to just pay play the three of a kind because you're gonna get more points mm -hmm. because you've leveled up three of a kind. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's get through this first. All right, so let's mm -hmm. play the flush that we've got here. And this should take us right over the top. Because uh, we're already at 240. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And now, right now, there's no multipliers besides what's in the cards. So, this is kind of like showing you the most vanilla mechanics. And then, now we're going to get some money because we, with some, some dollars here. So, we cash out, get $5. Now we have nine. And now we can start to buy jokers. So, for example, this gives us plus 100 chips and then minus five chips for every hand played, so it kind of gets worse over time. Uh, this is gonna level up flush. Uh, so actually, let's do this. Let's, let's kind of start to go for like a flush type run. So I'm just gonna hit buy and use. That's gonna use three dies. <laughs> Travis and I both yeah. disapproved. <laughs> disapproved. Oh. Um. <laughs> okay, Travis, what would, you, what would you be spending that nine bucks on? Uh, is it too late? I spent. I, I bought I would, the flush. The flush planet. I mean that that's going to help you too. But the uh, I found that getting jokers on the board as soon as possible helps a lot. But I, my thought was actually go joker into spectral, and yeah. the whole point being that there's some spectral cards that will like give you a polychrome or like it'll change your joker in some way. Yeah. But if you if you but if you run the spectral before you lay down the joker there's a chance that the spectral cards won't do anything because true, you ha true. don't have any jokers to apply to yeah that's true yeah. and actually spectral spectral packs are kind of rare so i think that was a little bit of a fail there all right no but it's uh, that being said though mistakes <laughs> big mistakes at the outset <laughs> let's go mitch what would you have done i would have done the same as you jo uh, joker than spectral because i i find i don't like to invest too much in leveling up my hands until i know what my deck is Right? right, like because this may not end up being a flush deck. That, that being said, though, Joker I feel like the first the for, for a while, like flush is what I always that was my go to. I would always yeah. do a flush deck. I feel like it's an easy place to start. All right, so let me. I'll buy this Joker, and then let's yeah. go into the next round. So now we need to get four fifty. All right, so let's sort by suit. So we've got so we can go pretty directly. There you go for. Although here we've got a three of a kind, which actually will get rid of. So this is something that I think is kind of important, like using hands to discard, right? Even if we want to get to hearts, right? We're going to clear out two of our non-hearts here, playing this three of a kind. Um, what do you guys think of and that? And the other thing I learned play? is you can, th you can throw that six in there as well into the hand. Yeah. Right, it doesn't yeah, matter. Exactly. It just plays that's a good a point. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a key. Yeah. That's a key idea, but, I think. So let's get rid of that six as well. I'm going to keep the king. Before you play it, though, I yeah. think if you if you if you draw for a flush, then it's a one hand. You get more cash. Okay. And mm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's like true. just just pull like pull out everything. King nine six and nine just try and, to get and a flush on the first hand. Aim for a yeah, because yeah, you have four discards too. You know, better and you got than it. Oh, there you go. And then you, because you have that, you multiply. You have a multiplier for flesh. You should get this mm -hmm. right away. Yeah, I think. Yep. Turns out that was a good. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you will. Turn. Turns out that was a good buy. That planet card. See? Yeah, it was. Look, oh, when you see flames, that fire, the yeah, flames that's, are getting that's going. The dopamine, well, yeah. The dopamine. Oh yeah, we got it. We're there. Boom! All right, nice. <laughs> 
Nice. And so because Matt bought that card that leveled up his flush, his flush is even more powerful. Yeah. Dude, we got a Billy in here? We got hey, a Billy on deck! Hey, let's go. <laughs> oh, here it comes. I'm like... I'm Matt's got to do a quick pivot. Mode. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Let me, re- let me move myself over to the side here. Um, you in my bathroom, Mitch? Is that where you are? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me adjust. I'm so the glad somebody's Mitch, in Mitch, you're clipping a little bit still. If you can, I don't know oh, if you can lo- it just be. Yeah, can I you can just be less loud, please? That's, uh, that's my <laughs> request for you. <laughs> less <laughs> loud Canadian, please. Um, yes. All right, okay, let's go. Half, all right, so welcome, Billy. We're playing Bellatro. Uh, all right, so what do we got? When blind is selected, gain plus three hands. Whoa. That's a chaotic one. Yeah, I've, n- I've never seen that one. Me neither. It's uncommon. Let's take it. Let's go chaos mode. Or, yeah. right? Let's do it. Let's, let's, be, let's, let's be wacky. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to keep my $2. All right. Ooh, going right into the pillar. Cards played previously this anti are debuffed. Okay, interesting. All right, so we've got seven hands and no discards. That's kind of interesting. All right, so pair of aces. No discards, so we've got to play something. Yeah. Let's do it. And you got a good, you got a good straight draw, too. Billy, have you played this game before? You're muted, yeah. I, um, when we first talked about it on whatever stream that was a couple of days ago, I downloaded it in the background and played it while we were streaming. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, that's as far as I've gone. Mm, what do you guys think here? I've got a pair, but a shitty pair because this card is debuffed. And it's going I would to say up pay- my chance for a straight draw. Put all this. Put the six five four three, the six five five four three up there, and that way you're going to get your max number of uh, um, pulls, and then you, you have you have you have to all you have to do is get two hearts for your flush. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Right. Right. So dump the others. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. Go. Yeah. So you're playing the pair plus you're getting. And that's smart because we have zero discards here, right? So we need to yeah. use get rid of junk with the within the hands. All right, do we get a flush? No, we got two kings, two eights, two pair, two pair, yeah, uh, two pair, and then it'll you know, probably take flush is kind of out of reach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is the easy. This is the easy one. So we just let's just win. What does the debuffed mean again? It just means they just, don't get no points. points. Yeah, they're like they count towards the hand. Like if you if you pay, play like a pair and one of them is, you still get a pair, but it's not. Uh, you don't get the points for the card. Yeah, because each card will add some blue points here that then get affected by the multiplier. All right, nine dollars. That was good. All right, so okay, what do we got here? Celestial. It really feels like the merge of, um, you know, like slot machines where there's all these like little side bonuses that give you back portions of the amount that you paid, but like never more than you actually paid. Yeah. Like you've just like poker has one win condition and now you have like a myriad of like baby win conditions that hit that little like, oh, I'm good at poker. Uh, yeah. Joy center. Totally. Uh... And so... What do you guys think about this final hand? It's it could so save us from say, dying, but it's kind of weak, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's gar- It's almost a guaranteed like don't lose. But, but we're not going to use that. <laughs> you're chopping up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you like lower your bandwidth or right? something, Mitch? You're chopping. You're roboting. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Can I do? Sorry. Or can so I, I was saying. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. I, yeah, I that's better. That's better. Video. Your your sexy um, video is nice, but ah, that's too bad. There, too a little too sexy, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the six dollar joker it's good it's like it's a guaranteed don't lose but we're not going to get to use it that much because we're getting yeah. seven hands per round right yeah yeah Whereas that's true with, actually with we're going to go way hands, yeah, yeah, yeah. no it's terrible and, and also by yeah, using so it so you're not going to be getting as much money from your debt uh from every round because you're using all your hands yeah yeah, yeah exactly okay we're not going to buy that then so i'm going to buy the tarot cards you guys agree yeah 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 totally all right and this also just love opening packs even packs that are not real just always feels good uh all right so creates the last tarot or planet card um gives a total sell value five dollars that's not really worth it destroy two cards mm. Mm. i'd honestly kind of take the money the five it's not very much yeah i'd go for, i'd go the full the, I'd go the full and maybe hold on to it so that when, you, if you get something like, cause you know, there's that one where it doubles your money, right? Like there's like, you have to, you have two consumable slots right now. Yeah. Like you could play the flush if you needed it. Like if all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm in a bad situation. If I do this, I can use it, but you could also hold on to it for a round or two and yeah. then make that decision. All right. Let's try that. That's smart. Oh wait, it plays the, oh, it plays it yeah, right away. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was like you actually got to hold it in your deck. No, yeah. Well, I mean, all right, that's fine. I'm so I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna upgrade flesh again, right? No reason. Yeah, to de yeah. Destroying cards at your at this time though wasn't really gonna help you that much though. Like, no, I don't. The only think other so. would have been would have been would have been for the cash. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so we've got seven flesh. i don't want to go four of a kind i'm going to get another no. more planets sure <clears throat> let's see what we got okay uh level up pair level up three of a kind full house high card or straight no we can't buff flush What do we think? Maybe high card is a kind of a backup. Yeah, I see, yeah, I actually, yeah. Um, kind of yeah, get, especially because you're going to be playing hands just to throw stuff out. Yeah, right? kind of get out of danger, and this is a plus one malt. Your garbage, you know, we can get, yeah. yeah, all right, let's do it. Yeah. All righty. One of the things that I always like to look at when I play games like this is to see all of the little feel stuff that they do, like for opening packs and little animations when your cards are delivered to your hand. I always like, I, I love those little details. And, you know, now, you know, not playing, I get to see it with a little bit more clarity. And even like the opening pack animation, like it's the most super basic, like, particle generation thing that like comes default in like the unity shader pack or whatever yeah yeah yeah. but it just you know it just it just works totally uh, the side unlock you know when it's like oh you unlock the new deck on the right um yeah, yeah nice i think little, that little pop-up window over here all right i'm gonna dump these should i keep the ace or just go for flush uh ooh, with the a you got you got like an inside oh but the, the straight draw doesn't matter because the three would also give you i mean actually wait a minute a i have a i have a straight right now straight. yeah yeah actually a straight no you don't yeah four five six seven eight boom okay that makes sense uh, what do you all think about the crt curve the scan lines yeah the uh, the what do you think about that aspect of like the art direction on this? I turned off the CRT scan lines immediately. Really, that's interesting. I yeah. I kind of am generally. Let's turn them off for a second. I generally we can turn off like here we go zero and zero CRT bloom pixel art smoothing. Let's just do like raw everything off. Raw. Oh yeah, interesting. This will be interesting yeah. to see. Look how flat it looks. It's so flat. It's so flat now. It's interesting. It, yeah, look at oh. it. It's also very, huh. you get a lot of pixel swimming, right? It's like, yeah. I feel like it's. It's lost the vibe for me. Yeah, I like that it has a kind of sleazy kind of 70s 
sort of casino, shitty casino kind of vibe. I feel like that's part of the part of. Is the that what it's going? Is it going for video poker? Is that the? Is that what this is like a reference to? I think so. Right. That's all I can yes. think of. Yeah. Okay, because okay, that makes sense. Because I that was the thing I didn't understand. I was like, the okay, there's like this pixel art aspect of it going on, but like I couldn't figure out. I, I was like, why was this chosen? Why is that? But yeah, it's video poker, so it's like the the thing that would be like at bars and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Totally, that's what it evokes for me. Okay, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, and I wonder how many of like those little animation yeah. moves I was talking about before. I wonder, I wonder how many of those little moves the designer is lifting from those video poker machine designs. Because it's super relevant to study, like how you reinforce those dopamine hits with subtle little gestures of animation and UI. There's uh, that book, Addicted by Design, by was a Natasha Dow Schull, where it's like all about the slot machine, like the, the games in- industry and how these these those decisions, those sounds, those lever pulls, those thunks, like all of that is kind of built for the dopamine for the hit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that, no, that I think say, it's prolonging the moment of anticipation, right? When the kind of coin flip is in the air, right? And it's spinning and you're like, okay, that's like the adrenaline moment for the gambling addict, right? It's like, okay, it's yeah. anything could happen, you know, like, yeah, totally. I mean, this is interesting. I do get, there was some interesting controversy around this game because it got a Peggy rating for gambling themes in Europe uh, and thereby mm-hmm. got banned and put off of certain storefronts or whatever, um, which is obviously it's not a poker game. It's not a gambling game at all. But I do get a little bit of that gambling high feel, uh, you know, drawing, drawing sure. the next hand. I was going to say, this feels kind of like a crypto native game or something like that. There's like sleazy retro tech, like unabashedness around yeah. like financial gambling, sort of just like, oh no, like we're, we're doing this like full stop now. Like we're not pretending that we're not doing it. We're doing it and we're embracing it. And like, yes, we have a, a rating that says we're like addictive and like, yes, we've taken every single, you know, uh, nefarious, dark design, abusive uh, design property we're we're fully embracing that like that's yeah. the sleaze look at we, we have the joker you know embrace the sleaze yeah that's a <laughs> that's a good take i think um, yeah i'm gonna play a shitty high card hand here yeah that's that, that's smart um but yeah to come back to that it's super relevant like this is i think a super like crypto relevant game and like not to get too much into it but this game is basically how the entire blast the blockchain works Okay, like for anybody <laughs> who's been playing on the Blast Casino, which, by the way, for our listeners out there, I do not endorse. Don't do this. But like, <laughs> if 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 you did, like, this is almost exactly how it works. In the sense, at first, you're looking at your points. You're seeing, oh, a king is worth ten points, right? And then, and you know, an eight is only worth eight points. And then it gets into multipliers. And one of the things that's interesting about this game is the extent to which it is a watch numbers go up game, much more so than um, than any other roguelike deck builder that I've ever played. Yes, I think that's true. It has some of that idle game energy, right? Idle games being that I keep trying to move my move my face over the right box. You guys are moving around, change, turning your video on and off. Um, it does have some. <laughs> <laughs> it's like whack-a-mole. It's its own kind of game. Can I keep my camera over my box? Uh, <laughs> it definitely has some of that energy. I'm going to go for this plus 20 malt, right? It's kind of the similar declining kind of thing as this other Joker, but I need Jokers. I need multipliers. You, guys you can always sell it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's good. Get Especially that. if you're, like, getting close to, like, when you're if, – if you're not hitting – beating oh, it on the one. first hand, Yeah, it's like – I feel like that's always a move. Like if you're not, if you can't beat it by your first hand, then yeah, you probably need some new need Joker some action going on. Yeah, I mean, we need. I have basically <sighs> no multipliers right now, so uh, I need need to get my multipliers yeah. up. Okay, so we're gonna. How, how long did you all play before you realized you could move cards around? Because that was something that actually it was only like when I, I saw there was like. Around? A, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, it took me a while to realize that that was something you could do, and there was like one Joker that mentioned 
like that it would be to the to the left or oh, right. The and I was like, dagger oh. one. The dagger one is super good. That it it eats a Joker to the right of it and then gets ups its multiplier. I feel like that's one of the things you always want to be looking out out for. And this is like probably an interesting thing about this game is it's like a scaling game, right? It's about keeping your power curve scaling as the difficulty is scaling, right? So like anything where you can add multipliers um, is like really important, which I think is true, Mitch, is very much related to the Blast Casino. It's like, are we, exactly. are we multiplying our Blast points? Which are points too, not crypto coins, but points. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. points meta. And yeah, in, in this game for me, like the golden rules, anything with an X on it, like the multiply sign, that's what you get. Not the word mult. Yeah. That's only like giving you, taking you from like plus 10, from like times 10 to times 11. But if it's like times two, then it's taking you from, you know, times 10 to times 20, right? But then you're growing exponentially. Exponential growth, power laws, number go up, etc. Ooh, I got a straight. Uh, I'm going to use this. I'm just going to enhance my face cards, right? Everybody agrees? Um, it, it depends on if you can, if, if you, if you're trying to win on the first hand, right? Like, if it's uh, if if you can win on the first okay. hand so without without that I'm gonna play. yeah, like to do it into the jack ten or something like it's it makes sense, yeah, but yeah. but also it's like if, if you're already gonna win, then you know. No, no, no. That's a good move, though. Okay, yeah. All right. There you go. So now those cards are worth more points, and look in, in some in some cases, right? Like that's you know it ends up being a pretty powerful multiplier. Just, just increasing that base number that yeah. now is multiplied by four, and then soon will be multiplied by nineteen. Um, there we go, and, flames. Uh, there we go. But yeah, I do think um, I think it? Billy's point about this having a crypto, crypto feel, kind of gambling feel, um, is an interesting one, even though. There's no betting, right? There's no, or I guess the ante, right? But you're not even paying anything on the ante. There's no actual betting. It's just the kind of satisfaction of watching your combos fire off. Betting is kind of too Chad. Betting has too much like uh, con man swag in it. This is much more like, um, you know, uh, farming, slaving away and the, the crypto farming, like earning your points for, for doing your tiny tasks um, also feels very crypto part of it. That's interesting. Yeah, it is, and and like it's it's almost a casual game because, and this is something I was talking about with you guys in the Discord as we were prepping for this episode. Like an interesting thing about this, and another ways, and, and another way that it feels like gambling, another way that it feels like like crypto casino ethos, is that the difficulty curve is is so fucked up. Like the difficulty curve is like a step function. It's not a curve. And yeah. where you're just coasting, like right now, you know, we're um, like, we maybe don't have the most powerful like Joker synergies, but in this game, either you are coasting all the way to the end because your like, like, like the, the, the deck you built is so overpowered or you hit the wall on yeah. like, the, your like fourth hand. And I have very, very few games that happen in between. Yeah, I really, I really like, like that part of this, and I think that's actually a, a part of the appeal of Slay the Spire is the feeling of, of high variability in outcomes and being able to make kind of broken feeling overpowered combos. I think is like a core part of the satisfaction of this. Right, is like when you just blow out the um, the score target. Right, because you've got some totally feels like almost cheating kind of vibe yeah well and and it, it's very similar to the phenomenon you were talking about last week with mosalina as a dangerous generator yes. a generator that produces outcomes that are not optimal for gameplay this game produces a lot of combinations and generates a lot of combinations that are not an optimal gameplay experience the way we think a video game is supposed to be which is a very graceful difficulty curve which brings you up but the fact that it's so popular that I get so addicted to it also tells me a little bit more about what I enjoy about some, some games, which is that 
you know, you want to, when you play games, you do want to power up to the point of being omnipotent, right? Like, you just, you want to be a god. And it's like, you don't, um, it, and, and, and mm. in this game, like, you, you get to do that. You get to be so powerful. And I'll keep playing after the drama is out of the game whatsoever, like out of the game entirely. I will keep playing with my super OP deck and yeah. just keep clicking, play hand win, play hand win, play hand win. Because that is, it's so funny. Yeah, we think that we want these smooth difficulty curves, but we also want like, I don't play Civilization Six to like eke out cultural victory the games of civ 6 you remember are the games where you are just stomping the map with giant death robots in the year 1840 you know yeah yeah no i do think that that's and and the fact that you want to keep playing after you won and just keep feeling that power of like a overpowered combo i do think it is very kind of telling you know yeah because that's that's uh -huh. not how i play it as soon as I beat it, I'm like, okay, on to the next deck. Yeah. Like, I, I don't so stay with it. It's interesting how you play video games. Oh, I, would, I, have, a, I have a question uh, related to this that I'm thinking about. And I talked to you about this before, like, of when players are allowed to be creative inside of games. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about this in relationship to the num you're talking about numbers go up. And, and so, like, one thing is I kind of would like you all to define what a numbers go up game is because... I, I don't I haven't really been thinking about this game in those terms. And I think I've been thinking more of it in terms of the possibility space of play, like in terms of all the different combos that you can unlock. And and I was wondering like is like do I think about this as like creative decision making? Um and, and as a separate thing from like if you go on YouTube, right, there are people that have already made mods for Bellatra that's like I'm doing an all glass card deck. And I'm going to see how far I can get, right? Like where they're like making custom decks to see how far they can take it through the, this game structure. Um, yeah, so it's like, I, I think my questions are, how do you all define numbers go up? And as a player in this, do you feel like you're making creative decisions? I do think building combos, well, it's, a, it's cool. It's a, for me, like what I think roguelike, these kind of heavily random number generator driven games give me the feeling of, improvising within a limited framework, right? If the game is kind of throwing weird choices at me and pushing me down a track, and then it's my job to kind of improvise against those conditions and use my knowledge of the overall system to kind of respond and, you know, either survive or win. <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. It's, uh, yeah, like, uh, improvisation as, like, it, it, do you feel like that that is, like, maybe a tiny dopamine, like, a creative dopamine hit or something? Like, it's this little moment, moment of be, trying to be clever or trying to uh, hook something together? I do, yeah. I think that's, I think it is a, well, it is a creative thing, right? Building combos. I feel like fundamentally it's a big game about building combos and building your deck and building synergies, right? Which I do think is a creative um, action. All right, I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to try to get this thing. The monolith. Should I get this? It looks Ooh. cool. Uh, well, yeah, anything, anything that's in like an X. Plus that yeah, X. and it's rare. Yeah, so I'm just gonna sell, I'm gonna sell yeah. everything. So so this is like so what what's our most played so, hand right now in the run info? Good question. Flush it looks like. Two pair. Yeah. Flush. Oh, no, two, pair. Two, two pair. pair. Two pair. So actually, this is this is gonna go great with our uh, with, with our deck that gives extra hands. Do we still have that card, or did you get rid of that one? I, I just got rid of it. Oh, I shouldn't have said ah, that. Well, so bad because, because we could have just played garbage hand, garbage hand, garbage hand, get the multiplier up, and then, like, within within three rounds, like, that could have been, like, an, an X3 multiplier card. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But it's okay. I mean, yeah, well, it's no, played good. without playing your most play. Oh, interesting. That's yeah, a, yeah. So just as long as you just, 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 like, play a, like, you know, play a high card, play a pair, you get that up to 1.5, right? Uh, it, it, it'll be fine though. It'll 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 still work. It it was just too hasty. Should have listened to my advisors. Yeah, okay. so, oh. Something we talked about too with this game that I really like, and it, maybe it, I don't I don't know if that this feels like 
50 hours into it. But at any point when I feel like the run is failing, I go into experimental mode where I'm like, yes. oh, fuck it. Let's get this, get this card and see what it does. And sometimes it works out. And it's just like, or it, it, it's like an interesting way of teaching you more of the game's mechanics because it's just like, well, I'm not going to win this. So let me try this card out to see what it does and then learn things. Like, I'm still not sure what that, there's this one card you can get for $10 that does nothing. Yeah, I bought it's that like, thing. I bought it. I just like, couldn't what? resist. I don't know what that did. It was just like, oh, what would you okay. guys? What would you guys play here? I don't. I don't want to play my two pair because of this thing. This. This. Well, is, why? Right, because it's per oh, consecutive two pair, hand play our... without playing your most played poker hand. Oh. Is, is, is two pair our most played? Yeah. Hand? Sorry. Oh, okay. Then I would right? play. Uh, then I play one pair. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. I'd play one play, one pair and then throw the five in there as garbage. Yeah, 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 yeah. See if we can get three of a kind on the sevens. What about this ten? I'm not going to get a... I might get a straight, I guess. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got a decent straight draw. Um, oh, okay, we, so we got a pro in the chat. Kevin's, like, giving lots of advice yeah, over here. <laughs> Kevin's <laughs> like, don't get modeled now. Too early. Don't get it? Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, we're we playing. We love that Kevin's here. We're playing Great Reckless. Great friend of the show, Kevin. Um, uh, I can't even see. Hold I, on. I, I got to get the chat open. I need. I need pro advice here. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. We can get, it, get it right up on the stream. I got uh, it. And okay. So I, I'm going to rebut and say I don't think. For me, this is not a creative game at all. Right. Okay. Like, yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm I, I do like. I do also sometimes enjoy like experimenting, like you, and like figuring out what the cards do. But for me, and and Travis, I'm so in awe of the way that you play video games. And actually, I really love seeing how everybody here plays video games differently. But like, no, for me, it's just like that experimentation. It's just my. It's just my R and D budget. Like to, to get <laughs> out of ruthless efficiency. I am just ruthlessly <laughs> trying to take the most efficient path to the highest numbers. And it just makes me realize that, like, that is what I do. I am super interested in, um, I'm like, I'm super interested in, in all the design decisions that make this gameplay loop work for me because I'm convinced that it's, it's the, the, the addictiveness of the gameplay loop, it's not just the gameplay. There's a bunch of small decisions that, as you guys pointed out, we're really honed in the design of, of gambling machines and stuff like that. And it's just a super interesting thing for me to look at and try to study because also those design principles of gambling machines are basically the design principles. Like, like they are now the design principles of our entire built environment online, right? Yeah. All, yeah. all the world is a Bellatro game. Wow. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should cut the stream there. Mitch just landed the plane. Hold on, I'm trying to get that now. I just re I remembered. I forgot to put the chat up. Let me see if I can get the chat on stream. I, Doing a I, wrote, I wrote down. It's like. not. It's not a creative. It's a R and D budget. That's that's a good line right there too. Um, I wonder though. There's something about the game itself that does still feel like it's hitting some creative uh, output, and it's it's not at the player level as you're as you're saying, Mitch. What comes to mind, and and hear me out. The question would be, is um, is the game indie sleaze? Ooh. And what I mean by that is a use of that term, which I did not really know or think of until I watched this week's Brad Trammell video essay on the history of the hipster. And after this long historical arc that he talks about all the different phases of hipsters, et cetera, moving into sort of like um, the, the, uh, the, what is the word? The protester, the, the uh, sort of hipsters moving into activist culture, right? That uh, we've seen the reemergence of indie sleaze as a kind of desire to just be like, fuck it, let's have fun again. You know, there's like, you know, blogosphere, millennial, like Cobra Snake was like, yeah, you know, Everybody hated hipsters, but like it was kind of fun to go party in those times. And like people don't party anymore. They don't have like that youth culture has sort of like evaporated further and further online. And now there's like a nostalgia for that like last wave of kind of like not caring and being sort of like flippantly, you know, not aware of what's morally or ethically slightly out of touch here. And like the gambling would be the thing here that you're sort of like, fuck it, it's fun. Like who cares? Like 
I'm gonna just like, it's almost like edgy, a little edge lord and like a little sleazy. It also is retro. Uh, I mean, if you Google indie sleaze, I'm sure you'll you'll immediately be reminded of the sort of like fashion sense of it. But I wonder if there's some sort of like cultural resurgence. Why this game now compared to like this game itself as being like actually that you know uh, distinctive as a game mechanic or really setting some new standard? Maybe maybe it's just the exact right moment for a game that has these sleazy characteristics. Yeah, I do think that's also like what we're seeing in crypto with the kind of like current like meme coin mania, like this kind of naked, you know, people are like, oh, it's like financial nihilism. Like I kind of think, or maybe it is, but it's like this gambling um, and just the way that gambling culture is just becoming so omnipresent now with like legalized sports betting in the US and like and obviously crypto, like this, this embrace of kind of gambling culture, you know, maybe in the face of like a larger existential despair, um, or the feeling like that the financial ladder is like otherwise out of reach. Mm -hmm. Came up a lot. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about Brad Tremel and his video essays, but that, that posing was actually a big part of like the, the hipster mentality in the 2008 financial crisis and the sort of like, Oh, like, you know, uh, uh, actually like anxiety induced revelry yeah yeah that makes sense to me i mean i remember i was like in my 20s during that period in new york when that was all like popping off and i it was a kind of a you know and it was also like post 9 11 um that was like when vice magazine was like starting to pop up it was kind of like the first wave of like the kind of nihilistic alt-right kind of Pre or pre-alt-right Gavin McGinnis putting like swastikas on t-shirts in the do's section of the do's and don'ts in Vice Magazine kind of vibes. Um, there definitely is some kind of like resonance with the current moment. I, I hadn't, um, it's, it's funny like the, because it's poker, because it's cards, because it's like there's this kind of, no, the, the numbers and the multipliers, um, like I, I, I'm still not thinking about it in terms of numbers go up, of of just like how do I make that number go up? But I am like, and, and because of that, it's like this the read that you're talking about, Billy. Like I can I can see that from an outside perspective, but when I look at this from a game designer perspective, I look at it from someone who just found ways of like kind of like when you're playing it of like making these really interesting synthesis like explosions where it's just like oh now i have this new rule that when i apply this rule to things it just completely changes the system again and it's like i feel like there must be such a web of decisions and design choices that's keeping everything from crumbling apart and it feel like um it feels like this just not of game design or something to me um yeah i mean i also th i need some stream give me advice what hand should i play next kevin do your worst. Billy, you're muted. Uh, oh. <laughs> Am I muted? When I, when I, oh, Billy's muted. I, I was just as a reply to, to Travis's statement about that, like I immediately lose control or any feeling of being able to, like it's just too complex to be able to like make the right choice when there's that many sort of combinatorial strategy things. And then I go right back into just like slot machine mode. You know, like nobody knows what the rules of the slot machine are, but there's a million sort of like sub rules that give you this bonus and add on this thing. And nobody's actually able to track those things even, you know, it's sort of like you need to know that there is an internal logic that justifies them. But there's almost this sort of like, well, fuck it, you know, it's random anyways. Like, you know, I might as well do this or this because who knows? And, and I know there's way more thought and control possible here. But when I was playing it, there was certainly a degree of like, well, you know, who the fuck knows? I, I, I'll try this, but it's like, it's impossible to make a perfect decision in here. You know, even if you have like a well-informed decision, there's a lot of luck that could just wipe away your, your great strategy. And, and I feel like that's like a kind of uh, number, number go up nihilism that, that maybe is, is what we're talking about here. But maybe I'm also, maybe we're using the term number go up nihilism or something differently. That's an interesting point though. I feel like that kind of surrendering to the chaos kind of surfing the chaotic wave uh, is, is definitely part of the feeling. Like here's a moment, right, where, especially with this like thicket of rules that we have, right? So I don't know, right now my things are tied, right? I've got three and three, 
or actually three of them are tied, right? Is flush going to reset? Does a tie count as my highest thing? Um, so let's find out. We're well, it'll be good to do anyway because then all the other hands will definitely not be your 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 most played. That's true, actually. Okay, then we're going to cut yeah, flush so off. It, it'll, it'll free. It, yeah, it'll it'll free up the. Uh, yeah, or Kevin was saying play play something ten times in a row and then never play it again, which yeah. maybe that's what maybe that's our approach approach with flush. All right. Yeah, pivot deck. Oh, but you did it. Yeah, those that black contrast. Oh right. fuck! I play. Oh fuck! God yeah. damn it! Yeah, I misplayed. Yeah, okay. I was talking. Oof! Um, what was that? A high thought, card? So did I play a high card? Yeah. Two high, high cards. Card. So it was still still good. I mean, actually, I could just level up high card. The the point Billy was oh, yeah. talking about. Yeah, go ahead. With, Sorry. Uh, oh no. Yeah, when you're so close to winning, or you could just play a high card at the beginning of every round, and then you would get that up and be the highest. Oh no, it. It's got two. I'm gonna try that. Let's try bump up high card. Even though it's on a really good straight draw right now. Yeah. Well, it's not nice. Nah, straight draw is not that good. Only five gets you there. Only five gets you there. Or I could bump. Move. Or I could bump up two pair. Anyway, Travis, what did you want to say about what Billy was saying? Let's keep the keep. Uh, <laughs> um, the that um, the kind of because there's so many choices defaulting to just uh, like uh, it doesn't matter. Press like I feel like I that's that, that's one of the reasons like I like games like this or Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup where there's just like all kinds of. Uh, randomizers hitting you all the time and, and and maybe that's what makes the choices feel more creative is because it, it, it's like it's not like a, a binary it's a floating point and you're just kind of or like it, it's not an integer it's a floating point and you're just kind of moving between the spectrum and it yeah there is no right or wrong but there's just like all these different odds and you're kind of always looking at the odds to kind of think about the decisions you want to make um and 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 behind the scenes, maybe there isn't that much. Um, or it, it, it definitely feel like I'm learning all the time, and so there does feel like there's more control there. I, th I think what I'm trying to say is that I, ne I I never default in these situations to just continuously pressing hit hit hit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I do think this game does a really good job of letting you play in a very basic way, but that it has a nice low skill floor and then a nice high skill ceiling. <clears throat> like mm. you can just ignore this screen and run info. Right? Matter what if like what if like the dev like on your side of things, like how have like what if game designers thought of this? Like um it's funny. Of, of I mean I have it well I know it, it, there was a demo out for a while and it definitely the demo was like buzzing among game designer friends of mine for before it came out. It was like pretty anticipated before it came out. And then the only, I didn't really catch the drama, but there was, I only caught like somebody talking about it, but there was drama because people were like mad at the Bellatro dev because he wasn't like a serious poker player. And like, there, he was like a poser. He's like a poker poser was the idea, uh, which I thought was really funny. Um, so yeah, shit. Did I fuck up? I think I might have fucked up the stream. I've... Those are the de degenerate, de degenerate identity politics, man. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, like, I'm not sure exactly. I'm like, not you're sure not this like is a your serious story to poker. Tell. Guy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you're, it's like a, appropriation culture for poker, uh, cultural appropriation. All right, no, it looks like Travis is still on there. I don't know why the YouTube stream looks kind of weird. Yeah. I don't know. You're there, Travis. Okay, I see Travis. Sorry. Okay, good. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I'm here. Just checking, um, making sure I'm doing my job. This is a little hard. I'm like running the stream and playing. I have sympathy for you, Mitch. I, it's also hard I don't, to play I don't know well. how y'all are doing it. It's hard to play oh, well and talk. Like, Jesus Christ. I'm oh, like, it totally making is. Making critical yeah. mistakes I, here. Yeah, I mean, last week, th like, thankfully, the, the first half of, of gameplay was, was recorded. But it, it was it was like authentic because it was like it was, it was I recorded my gameplay just so that you know I would have like a real connection to the material there. It was authentic um, artisanal gameplay. It, it's it's all it's always artisanal gameplay on the Art and Video Games channel. This is a weird um, one. 
two flush draw. All right, I'm going to discard oh, I these. I hate that. I hate that. I'm going to do it. Let's go hard. Suited with, with two suits. Yeah, let's go. Um, the um, so, so so here's the thing, like about just just retreating a little bit from the conversation and, and the position that we were taking previously, because I, I think this game is not that degenerate nihilistic. Uh, it is it, 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 it's because it's as you pointed out early in the stream, Matt. There's not even gambling in the game. Like yeah. there's not even gambling in the game, right? It's just points go up. And what oh, it is to me, it's just oh, it's the end of the yeah. run, brutal. I didn't even know I was about to die. Look at that. I got four points shy. Brutal. Oh. Brutal. All right, let's go again. All right, I've been surprised how often I'm using a calculator in this game, too. Really? Oh, God, dude. <laughs> yeah. You play so different from me. I'm like, ah, oh, just play it. Whatever. We'll see what happens. Like, I'm definitely not. This is, I kind of know I'll never be the best at this game because, like, the optimal strategy is to, like, check the run info every hand, check the check your check, check, your what, check every hand, you know. Don't go to select. Don't hit select. Oh, oh never shit, mind. Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I'll, uh, let's restart. Let's restart so you can give me better yeah. advice. You want to check skip to the blind? What the, yeah, check to see what it is. Because if it's more than ten dollars, you should do it right away. Two um, up to five tarot cards. Uh, I don't know. I kind of always feel like getting Child, a Joker as early I, as possible. Jumbo Arcana pack costs six or eight dollars. Like so, it's, so it's, it, that that's at least six dollars worth of stuff, and I think maybe yeah. eight worth of stuff. All right. So so take the blind. Yeah. Okay. Take the tag. Oh, oh, you you meant skip um, it. Never mind, I lost my chance. Let's try it again. Okay, we're doing it again. We're resetting again. We're safe scumming. I, that's the thing that I never do, Travis, actually. That's really smart. Five dollars for skip blind. blind. Eh, no. Okay. Don't do that. Um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, yeah, that I don't think the game is like that, 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 that like degenerate, nihilistic. As you pointed out, um, there's not even gambling in the game. One conversation I'd love to have. You mentioned that this game got, uh, you said, a PG rating. Because Peggy, of, the like, Peggy rating in Europe uh, was, oh, okay. I for, it's like got rated like NC-17 or something, you know, equivalent, like okay. because of uh, the gambling no. themes. And so then it can't so, be on certain, like I bet you it can't be on Switch in Europe is my guess, which right. is Interesting. real so, bad money-wise. So, well, the point of that, like do you think, like, like do you think that it would have got that rating if these cards had anything on them besides Jack of Clubs, Ten of Spades, Eight of Spades, like if these were cartoon characters, all right, we're all definitely not. The Cyclops gives you eight points. Right? Yes. Exactly. Definitely right? not. And and uh, and I think to Billy's point, the like video poker, they probably just looked at a <clears> screenshot <throat> and were like, "Oh, video poker, yeah. get it out of here, sleazy CRT lines, get it out of here." So. My, 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 my point about the game is that, yeah, I don't think that there's, like, you know, anything, you know, moralistic or amoralistic about it. This feels to me like a designer who just looked at what roguelike deck building games are and just distilled it right down to its core. Like, just get right down there. That is like, key. Cards, this is a reduction. You know? It's a reduction on Slay exactly. the Spire. Yeah, which is really kind of beautiful to me. <clears throat> mm hmm it's just it's just core principles. Like, okay, we're building a deck game, but like you're building even just like you know if you're playing Magic the Gathering, okay, man, these are cards of different ranks of power, and some of them synergize together, right? And that's like like and it's basically it's just a 52, 52 card playing card deck. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, okay, so I think th this is a I think a really key contrast to Slay the Spire because this is obviously taking a lot from Slay the Spire in terms of the deck building and the adding the the jokers serve as like a rel relics in slay the spire i'll put slay the spire on a little later just so we can see like a couple minutes of it just to contrast it's like a very very popular game so i feel like it doesn't quite need as much discussion but the the so slay the spire has a map which has been removed mm -hmm. here uh and has this idea of combat and these complicated effects of like poison or you know, these different kind of complicated combat mechanics, and that is all stripped out here just in, the fa in favor of the kind of combat mechanic becomes poker hands, 
which is a, is a powerful simplification and in my mind makes the game so much better. It like yeah. really gets to the combo building, the deck building, and also the excitement of drawing hands gets kind of like refined and amplified. It hits my favorite part of Slay the Spire, which was when you could kind of build up this combo that like was unstoppable. Yeah. And and this and it feels like this is designed specifically to try to make those experiences, either through jokers or through how you like uh, manicure your your cards, your deck. Yeah. So there are two two game design decisions that I see here that really contribute to that that are not reductive at all, right? But 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 I think are actually really smart innovations. One is the ever presence of your your joker. Your, your joker cards right that's not in play the spire if i have, have that right like you don't have a certain number of cards that are just always out on the table triggering powers as your engine well you right? have relics you do have relics that that function uh-huh. kind of that way and they're always on so so that's not 100 percent correct yeah oh yeah you're right sorry i haven't played like i played a lot of slay the spy but hey I, Mitch, will you will you explain that? You said that word before, and I I feel like I sort of understand it, and it makes sense in this concept. When you say engine, what do you mean by that in a deck builder? Oh, oh, it's it's just like um, I, I'm I may be using the word inappropriately from like you know other games and like board games in particular, where like you know I think of uh, I think of all of my jokers up the top of the screen synergizing as an engine, right? My points are going to go through here and it's going to multiply them and it's going to multiply them and it's going to do this effect and this effect and that's like the, the, the engine that I'm feeding all the cards into, right? Yeah, I, I love that. I think um, that's such a, it's such a great way to describe. I mean, also it kind of gets once again to this idea of creative decision making for me of like building that engine so yeah. that you can start to run through it. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Okay, I'm going to let well, the stream catch up. I need Kevin to tell me what to buy. I need input on what to buy. What to buy <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeding my role as the expert here. I'm obviously the worst Bellacho player in this chat. So help me out here, guys. Maybe we should, we should have a very special episode of Art and Video Games where we, we bring Kevin down to, to, to Vegas for him to like, watch us on the Hell yeah. poker table. I feel like this. Um, we have this Joker, which is kind of a cop out, right? I don't want to prevent yeah, death. Yeah. This is kind of interesting. Gains. Yeah, dollars. it is. It's a gr- it's it's great early on, honestly, and then you can always sell it. All right, let's go for um, this. Well, that'll be the only thing I, I can buy. That's fine. I feel like right. that's like the this kind of move of early on getting lots of jokers or um, just trying to build up a cash reserve so you're getting interest every round is a great way of, of yeah. to get going. That makes sense. <laughs> Should I yeah. skip but the that, blind, that go for the tarot cards, or, or take the big blind? We have three dollars. Um, you're not going to. At most, you're going to get like seven. Five? I would skip the blind here, personally. Okay. I want to. Yeah, go for it. But I'm curious if the egg goes up in value. Oh no! Actually, hold on. Yeah. Well, so, so if we think about it with the egg, that would have been three dollars oh. plus um, yeah, yeah, yeah. four or five. No, no, no. I should have played been... the round. I should have played the round to get the yeah. egg to trigger the egg. That was right, Mitch. Okay, let's That's see. Nice. Clubs, world, chariot, judgment, or strength. Oh. Get another ace in the deck. I would take the steel card. Got it. Creator or a random, random joker because we only have. Yeah, oh, we can take two. Oh, this is nice. This is good. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to take the random yeah, yeah, joker pretty... first. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. Nines. A dollar for each nine. Okay. Your full deck. So, so your your so your engine right now is leading towards uh, gaining lots of money, yeah. which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the steel card, right? I think so. Yeah. What should I put? Like it a on? steel card. Oh. oh, actually, this is a good question for you, uh, for you all. When you're using the steel card, do you put your steel cards on like lower inconsequential cards, that or do you try thinking. to put it put it on the two? I, I, I was wondering that, that? because what would you say, Mitch? I, I started off doing that, like putting it on the two, but then I found that it was actually better to, to, to put it on cards that I was going to play anyway. Because yeah. first of all, a steel card will automatically, like we'll make a pair of twos valuable anyway. 
And to just be able to get that double use out of it, like that if I really need to play it in a hand, I can. That's really good. So and then you also get would to you a throw it on the ace, Mitch? All right, I'm going to throw it on the ace. I put it on the ace. Let's do it. Yeah. Now. And then you also get to a point later on where all your cards are good. And then it yeah. sucks that you have this random stupid two of spades in your deck that is yeah. otherwise all super boosted king of hearts. Is. All right, let's try. This is going to be... Steel cards are the harder. best power up, I think. Previously played this. Um, that's the thing. When you take the money cards early, it's just hard to stay in the game. It's just yeah, it's yeah. hard to get past might, these might, first blinds. I might not make like it. Multipliers. But, um, so yeah, back to that thing, like those, those design decisions that make you hit your combos all the time, that gives you that dopamine hit that makes you feel real smart. Okay, so yeah, Slay the Spire does have relics, but I remember it's a big deal to get a new relic. And like once yes, you get a relic... Yes, like they're, kind of they're really rare. rare. They're really, you might get like, and, yeah. Yeah, and here, and so like you don't even feel like authorship over that, like you don't even feel authorship over that engine i'll use the term again it was just something that you kind of got steered into by rng it's just like oh it looks like this time i'm gonna have to have this kind of deck this kind of run but in this game you get to change that you get to change like your combo engine every turn it has five moving pieces all right so that's all happening up there and then the stuff you feed into it just being able to discard so like essentially being able to burn through half of your deck with no consequence every round that makes sure you can always hit your combo, right? So there's actually like much less RNG in this game, I think, than there is in, in Slay the Spire. Because you have yeah. a better chance, I think, of always hitting it. Now, again, I haven't played Slay the Spire in a long time, so I'd have to go and check that, but that's my instinct. Because I also have that feeling like, oh yeah, I get a lot more dopamine hit, a lot more feeling really smart about my decisions all the time. Yeah, I'm excited to see Slay the Spire because it's been. I, I was we, we were talking about this in the chat, and um, maybe uh, maybe people in the chat now have like. Uh, uh, I talking. We were talking about this on Discord, but this is something that came up for me. I played that game so early that when the actual kind of 1.0 release came out, I I didn't want to go back to it, and so I feel like I've missed I missed the best version of the game. Like I haven't even got to see like what it became. And um, there's only a few times that this has happened. And usually when I play like early access, it's like, it just makes me more excited for the full release. And so I'm really excited to see what you all, uh, what it's become. Because Matt, you said you went, you got really into it too, right? I played a lot, a lot of, I think I'm going to die. I played a lot of Slay the Spire. I'm going to try to draw for a full house. Um, yeah, I played a lot, a lot of Slay the Spire. I really... Um, I really love it uh, as a, well, just for a lot of reasons, but I think that it, it rewards spending a lot of time with it, you know, because of this kind of engine building stuff and, and, you know, a run is like an hour. I think actually that's kind of a nice thing about this is I feel like runs are, or maybe just cause I'm playing badly, but runs are, are maybe even shorter than Slay the Spire typically. Um, so you get that, like you say, tra like I probably wouldn't do what Mitch does of continuing a run after I had won, um, because I love restarting, rebuilding, you know, building those synergies up again. Actually, another game I think that's a relevant reference here that I could maybe e even throw on for a couple of minutes mm. is, uh, Super Auto Pets, um, Super mm. Auto Pets has a lot of the same energy of building this team, building these combos, dealing with the RNG of what you're getting, although it is probably simpler. I don't know yeah, if yeah you I played that game that. after you recommended it one time in a different Discord. Um, and, and I really, uh, yeah, it really captured me for, for a few days. Uh, I, I understood the appeal of it. It's funny. I think that, you know, maybe this is the case with you guys as well. There's sometimes a discrepancy between like what I, in principle, like what I like philosophically and like what I'm actually going to plow all of my time into. Like, oh. because yeah, I yeah. want to, you know, like I, I want to like slay the spire more for the bells and whistles, right? And the extra layers of like creativity and sort of like, you know, narrative 
and art that go into it. But, you know, in reality, you know, I'm, I'm just like, uh, you know, I'm a lizard brain like anybody else. And I will probably plug more, more, more hours into this. And it's like, did you guys ever play just talking about kind of roguelike deck games that lean really hard the other way? Did you guys ever play the standalone, um, not even the standalone Gwent game from the Witcher universe, but Thronebreaker? The, oh, like, no. I loved Gwent and oh. Witcher 3. I like it was my favorite part of the game. Apparently the final the new Final Fantasy 7 game has a new card game that's really good too. Yeah. But yeah, I did, I well, tell me about Thronebreaker. So Thronebreaker, it's um it's 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 really on rails. Okay? It doesn't have quite this amount of of creativity, but it is an RPG like where you walk around an overworld map and then you have a fight encounter and the fight encounter is a card game and you um you know and you get cards and there will be certain encounters that you have in the world that are like special just gimmick hands where there is one obvious solution um based on like a gimmick deck that you're given and you get to once again sort of feel creative by figuring out what is the right synergy of these card powers that you have have in your hand um and it's really i mean it's an interesting counterpoint to this because it leans so far in the other direction whereas this is just totally stripped down so minimal and so off the rails that is the most high production on rails deck building game that that i can think of and you know i I want to say that I like that more, and in theory, in, in philosophically, I do. But I, I definitely like already put more hours into this. I mean, honestly, I, I'll take the other side of that argument. I didn't play that game; I looked at it. But I feel relatively strongly that the that that's the wrong direction. That 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 mm-hmm. that adding. Like, I think you could totally look at Slay the Spire and say, oh, what this needs is a bigger map and more narrative and richer world building. But actually, I think this direction of, well, wrong, whatever. But this, to me, feels like a real refinement. It feels like we're, we're unearthing the core ideas of this genre and kind of polishing them and hardening them by by taking things away so it's like maybe there is a big sprawling version of this that we get to later that is awesome for being the kind of death stranding of this genre the shaggy chaotic version but i feel like because this genre is still very much like in its early stages uh this is like a very very sharp refinement of it I can't wait the, to see the death stranding of mutant poker games. Yeah. This this um Thronebreaker, did did either of you play the Magic the Gathering games that came out in the nineties for PC? No. They had like they had whole quest systems and everything, and it was amazing. I mean like, you know, this is I was a kid at the time, but it was um it it, it was like taking Magic the Gathering and applying like uh, a world that you like walk through kind of similar to like how there was a Pokemon card game for Game Boy where it was playing Pokemon, but instead of like capturing Pokemon, you're capturing cards um, and, or you're getting cards. And, and so, yeah, I, I it, yeah, it, it's, 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 I feel like there's so many ways you can take these game mechanics and kind of flesh them out. Um, and uh, yeah, um, as, as Matt said, like it, feels very sharp here um I, i'm really glad you all kind of un- unlocked the video poker aspect of this for me because i that was something that was just really confusing me i was like i mean i kind of like the look but i don't understand why it's like crt like why it's going for this yeah and and uh but it, it carries it along a lot um it's also interesting to think about like as soon as you said gwent i could hear the music uh when i look at this even without hearing the music i hear the music um uh, and there's so many just kind of decisions that being made that um, that are impacting it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it, I, the the video poker insight was it was a key insight here for for me as well, and it made it it, it that also made a lot more sense. 
I'm going to buy this good guy. Point what you're saying. Multiplier X.25 Malt, right? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I like oh, this oh, card. Yeah, th that's, that's the one that I had on my best run. Let's go. That's the one go. that I had on my best run. All right, let's go. I, had a, let's I got go. another Joker that kept duplicating cards. So I got that guy up to be like a, a times eight multiplier. Nice. Um, yeah, you know, Matt, what you're saying is there is something to be said, and this was all the this has been all the rage in game design for a while. It's felt like where it's like, like, and now like in this game we're going to combine this genre and that genre. Like, okay, it's a deck building game and it's an RPG. Oh, what if it's like a skateboarding game and a deck building game, right? Um, but yeah. yeah, there is something nice about just to, so now let's do one genre of game just cut everything right down to the bone and see what's there because yeah I, I i have learned a lot about game design from playing this like specifically definitely like, like uh yeah for me the like always on and very interactive like joker cards as a highly interactive um, a changeable engine was huge and the high discard rate is also huge um, and those are I think really key insights on this genre for me that's certainly like what I learned from this game from a game design perspective just also minimal, liked... minimal elements but they're all super customizable and you get to interact with them and mess them around every round I think that's where the, cre the idea of creativity comes into is like that feeling of that so many parts are you're making decisions about all the parts of the engine. They feel like meaningful decisions on many different levels. You know, like what jokers, what planets, what tarot, what playing cards you're putting into your deck. Uh, you can kind of really modify, and I think you can form intent, right? You can be like, all right, I'm trying to make a flush run, or okay, now I've got this kind of like mm -hmm. card adding joker. I'm, this is gonna be like a pillar for my, for my strategy, right? And now uh, everything else should be tr trying to kind of optimize around adding cards, you know, should the opportunity present itself. Also, I think it makes, like, how we were talking about either staying with the run or starting over and starting over in Slay of the Spire, that in your, you, Matt, Matt, you said re restarting and rebuilding. And I think it's like, you know, that... I think it's because a lot of those creative decisions feel like they're happening early on there. Right. And it's less and then it's more just about execution on the later part of it. And and so, yeah, and I, I feel like that that's actually a really great thing of aiming. Like, I, I mean, Minecraft is like this for me, too. It's like I always love starting a new world because all of a sudden it's just like, OK, how do I how do this is the landscape I'm given? What am I going to do here? And and or, or a dungeon crawl stone soups, the same thing. It's like, this is the start of it. What is my character going to be? What, what weapons am I going to find? What, like, what am I going to focus on? Um, that over, over time through the game, the decisions feel tighter and tighter, maybe. Yeah. That is a really great insight, Travis. And it, it, it made me, yeah, it really makes me realize this. Some of the joy of this game is that, yeah, you do get to pivot your character, right? For, I'll, I'll use yes. the term character. But it's like this, like we started uh, Matt's, Matt's last game, right? He started off with, with money-making jokers. And if you've played this game, you know it's a risky strategy because you might, you might die. It's going to be tight. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, tight. I did die. I did die. I died on the boss yeah. of that first. Um, yeah, of, of the first run. What but would you also, guys buy here? It, it, I know there's no chance to add cards. This Joker, um, and I, I then then maybe I would I, some, maybe I, I just wouldn't I, I, I might not buy any. Just yeah, Kevin uh, Kevin also money. suggests nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, good advice. Um, Let's see. But it's like anyway with the with when you take the money jokers, you're also deferring the decision of defining what kind of deck you're at, right? Like it's yeah. uh, later on, you're gonna have to survive just long enough until you can build a deck that has a, a certain character to it that's gonna be successful, right? And yeah. one of the most exciting parts of the game is, like, is when you pivot your strategy. You started off trying to build a flush deck, but now conditions are such that, oh, actually, this is going to be a high card deck. And you get yeah. to you get to respec your character, basically, in the middle of the game. Which, Mitch, that's kind of, like, the happiest I felt, is that moment when I was like, well, I guess this is my high card deck. Like, you know, that, yeah. like, 
that moment yeah. of shift, that felt so good. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm doing it. This is where I'm heading now. Yeah. yeah. And you're totally right. Like, you just made me realize that it's not the classic video game thing of create your character, you know, create your character right at the beginning of the game. It's the first thing you do before you even enter the world, and then boom, that's your character. Execute for the rest of the game, right? Now, often, you know, video games will give you like five minutes of gameplay to get a sense of the world and then build your character and then just execute. Uh, and it's always an exciting part of a game whenever you like, you know, reach the part of the game where you can, you can respect your character if you didn't like your decisions. But this game, it puts that like character creator somewhere in the middle of the game and you get to choose it. And yeah, it, 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 is, it is the best part. When you and you have to kind of struggle into it, right? You have to struggle against the RNG. Mm -hmm. You don't just get to choose. You have to kind of, you know, fight your way to execute the goal. You kind of make a goal for yourself and now you have to kind of struggle to achieve it against the randomness and, and the chaos, which is very yeah. satisfying. And it's always... And it's always a risk-reward thing because the longer you put it off, probably the more money you'll have and you'll be able to build like a more powerful theme for your deck, but you also might, might die. And that's really great. That is, uh, now I realize, that's one of my key enjoyments of the game. It's not just, it's not just the number go up thing. It's, it's having an arbitrary moment where I get to decide how I want to make that number go up. That's key. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is really key. And and the satisfaction of forming an intent and then having it come together, right? Be like, okay, I'm going to go for card adding or I'm going to go for flush or whatever and then having that start to come together and kind of being proven right. Um, oh, six points shy of scoring. <clears throat> yeah. Totally agree. All right, we've got... 30 minutes left in our allotted time. Should I switch over and show a little bit of Slay the Spire so we can compare and contrast? I'd yeah, love to let's see do it. A little. Let's do a few okay, different. great. All right, let's switch it up. I feel like we've come up with some good, good thoughts and takes here. Uh, ooh. Well, maybe I'll finish this. Joker's track. a fun one early on, too. <laughs> it's just because you have to buy everything all the time. You're like, well, if I have any money, I got to use it. <laughs> And it's played with three dollars or less, and there's a spectral. Pack. Oh yeah, I love that one. This is chaotic. Times yeah, two malt. Spend your money. Lose malt oh, and discard. Great. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's like it's that and spectral pack. All right, let's do it. But I, I, I mean, at this point though, it's like it's it's a great first uh, anti card to get. Um, but, but yeah, uh, Kevin pointed out, you just don't get interest at all then. Yeah. Um, uh, create two copies of selected car. What was the, what's medium? Purple. Out of purple steel. steel. Oh man. The seals are always like, man, if I got I, something that could scale tarot cards though. Could yeah. Just go, like, I, I'm so, cards. I feel like the seals end up making, I end up making bad decisions because of them. Like I'm always like trying mm -hmm. to discard them or something. And I'm like, uh, like, it's like one element too much for me to like kind of, I feel like I'm, I, I lose control I'm with gonna, the seals. I'm just going to copy my ace. Keep it simple. Uh, I would, yeah, go, go, go for it. I, I would have gone seal there personally, just because like you don't have like a super OP card that's worth duplicating. All right, let's try it then. Let's try it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that was like already buffed up to duplicate. Let's try yeah. seal. All right. Yeah. All right, I'll finish this, and then I'll go to um, after defeating the boss blind, gain 15. That might be worth it. I'll be right back. Let's try it. I'm going to skip the blind. Base chips and malt are halved. Oof, this is going to be tough. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> I might die. That might be a good way to end. Uh, what would you do here, Mitch? Try for a flush draw? Oh, it's again, it's evenly yeah. split. Fuck. I know. But I, yeah, I'd go Two, for the Two, three, flush six, draw. ace. Yeah. You'd have a, you have a very high probability of getting it. Yeah, okay. And there you go. And then you got another flush draw for, well, sort of. Let's see what happens. 
3 and my 2 get played again. What does this do? One select a card into a wild card. Oh, that's kind of good. Okay, let's oh. see. Oh, oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, that's, Put a flush that, together. You now you're, yeah, now, yeah, there you go. Let's make this king wild. Let's see. I feel like it's still going to be pretty hard to get to 1600 with I don't have any multipliers basically. Oh yeah. It's a three selected cards two spades. Oh, more flush action. All right, you can get another flush, but man, you can. I'm probably not going to make it. Keep on cranking out flushes. You're still not going to get to 1600 points. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm not going to make it, but let's go. Let's try. There's nothing else to do here, right? There's no. Yeah. No. And I think I neglected my multipliers. What have we got here? Hearts, more flushes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm not going to make it. I'm well, NGMI. Yeah, when you get. Yeah, Three, when you get four, all five, of the. Seven, the, eight, nine. Like, oh. It's like a straight draw. This, the whole hand is like a straight draw. Three, four, five, seven, seven, eight, nine, jack. So we try to go for the, all right, let's just YOLO and try to get a 10. Nope. No. Nope. Two pair. But you got the flush. You have a flush. Oh, oh, oh. But it's, is that it's better? Not, but even a straight, I think, is not going to be. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make oh, one, it. Oh, what? Two hands? Yeah, I'm dead, I think. I've only got 360 points. Um, that's better, right? The two pair was 30. All right, let's do it. Yeah, you get a little bit more subbed out the four for the eights, but I don't think it was going to make a difference. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting some new language today to talk about these, th these concepts, which is really nice. Um, yeah. In terms of kind of the things that I think about in relationship to these games, um, mm -hmm. it's there's there's another game that is similar to Slay the Spire, but it's not card based. It's like pachinko based. It's called Peglin. Oh yeah, and you're like letting balls drop, and nice. and and so it's taking other yeah. aspects of Slay the Spire and kind of building off of them. And I don't know. It's like that also. They're, 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 this the the genre feels like it's continuing to morph. Of you know, like if you talk to someone who likes Rogue or Adam or Moria or like the actual Rogue adjacent games, so like none of these are Rogue likes. These are nothing like Rogue anymore. Like they're like that. These mm -hmm. they don't have. They're they're literally. They have very little in common, but the the genres like morphed so much, or like the ideas that have kind of uh, that are seated in the development of it has morphed so much that um, its effects can be felt felt in all kinds of things now. And um, this does feel like a kind of a, a new level of synthesis to some of the concepts in a way that's been is really satisfying. Like it'll be interesting to know if like we're thinking about this game in three months. Like, like is it mm -hmm. how what what kind of legs does it have? Because even though I'm playing this, like I still like I still am playing like Dungeon Crossstone too. Like I'm, there's still like these other rogue like games that I'm playing that a lot more. Um. Uh. Do do you, do either of you feel like that this has like the kind of is satisfying an itch that you'll keep keep with for a long time? For me, just knowing how I play video games, I tend to discard video games once I feel like I've yeah. learned their secret, right? And, and so it means that usually after after I talk to you guys about a game on a stream, I usually just never play it again. I was like, oh, okay, I figured out what I'm about. I figured out what I'm doing. <laughs> just like yeah. these streams are in many ways, yeah, my, my video game playing funerals. Um, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. And, and also I'm, I'm on the road right now, so I have an opportunity to quit. Cold Thanks, early, Kevin. Uh, with yeah, my yeah. sleep schedule. <laughs> All right. Let me get the, uh, let me get Slay the Spire up here. 
Are you playing a retro bowl on the on the on the commute? Retro bowl? No, I have it on my. I, you know what? I didn't even bring my iPad on this trip because I felt like I could bring like one less computer and that would be okay. Um, yeah. Retro bowl. Another game. Another game with the CRT. Uh, with like yes. A CRT like global uh, uh, like like a post processing effect that I immediately turned off. I don't know why. It's just something that I choose to be snobby about. It's a really dumb thing to be snobby about. It's like, I don't want that artificial CRT line. <laughs> it's it's not it's usually not well done. It's like it's there's a lot of bad att- bad attempts at it. Now that we have 4K screens, it is better. Like it's, you know, but um uh yeah, it's something I used to turn off a lot, but I find myself turning off less now. And especially with Blotter, I just let it ride. It was really great to kind of see it completely flat and without that post processing to kind of it was see what that experience I looked like. Off the CRT. Yeah, turning off the um, turning off the bloom and the uh, shadows that was really something else. Getting it real flat. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try another playthrough there. Yeah, I can still I, I I still have a little bit to learn about the um, I still have a little bit to learn about the. Uh, the like not game gameplay design but just the like um you know like, like the animation design and the uh that sort of feel stuff um, are you a settings head like when you like open up a new game are you like gonna spend like maybe 20 to 30 minutes getting everything right or do you just like let it ride for a bit before that you get into that mode not. i'm absolutely not a settings head it was just that this little playthrough that we did made me realize that, oh, I should look into it, because some of that stuff is some of that stuff is doing the subliminal work in your brain. Yeah. yeah I do, I think, yeah. I, I try to generally, I generally don't, like, at least definitely not to start, I don't start by turning, I, and even, like, when I find the, mu- like, I don't really like the Bellatro music, so, but I, like, try to leave it on for a while, just to, like, soak up the atmosphere, you know? Um, before I just like turn it on, try to you know experience it as the as the director intended. Um, all right, so I'm playing. So this is Slay the Spire, right? You can see uh, similarity, right, in terms of the structure. We're playing cards, um, and it, but in this case, instead of trying to play poker hands, we are fighting enemies and I think the really big innovation of Slay the Spire is or important dimension of it is that it's communicating what the enemy is going to do next turn right if this was random Mm -hmm. which I think it started early on in the design process as random it would be a lot less strategic but telling you okay he's going to attack me for 12 damage so for example I'm going to play neutralize which is going to lower him to nine and then I can play two defend cards which are going to give me 10 block total and I'm going to do a little bit of damage and take zero damage myself and then I'll deal deal a little bit of damage as well Um, so it allows you to uh, to form intents right and right now I haven't got any anything interesting yet so I don't know what kind of I got this card it's like a random rare card which you know I don't know what to do with really gain uh, it could later allow me to play expensive cards but right now is not um, <clears throat> doesn't feel very relevant. All right, so I'm going to get gold that I can spend in the shop. I'm going to take this potion, which is a one-time use item, and I'm going to add a card to my deck. And this is kind of where the this is like the Bellatro shop screen, right? This is where the um, kind of magic of the game happens. So, okay, deal six damage mm-hmm. for each attack played. All enemies lose six strength. It's going to apply a weakness and discard your hand, then draw that many cards and exhaust. So I already have something with discarding. This would push me towards, let's take this. This will push me towards, uh, with this character, there's something called a shiv deck where you have lots of cheap, um, small attacks, which may be what this is taking us towards. Um, All right, so they've got 13 damage for me, so I definitely need to um, defend. So lower. Can you play this with a um, uh, a controller? Yeah, actually, you know what? I want to hook up my controller. 
because it's interesting just like watching you interact with this like you're when you're there's so much more movement and touching and pulling and yeah. directing mm-hmm. in this and it's and, and it immediately just feels like nice. even though yeah we're dealing with cards it's like it's more like hearthstone it's like more like yeah um i think this is very very post 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 hearthstone post Hearthstone. Yeah, all those arrows that come out of the cards, it feels like almost exactly like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that their idea was like, what if Hearthstone but a roguelike? Uh, yeah. Was mm-hmm. really where this came from, much more than like Magic the Gathering or anything. I can't turn on the controller mid game, I guess. Anyway, that's fine. I'll put it at the mouse. Just, one, one of the things I'm thinking about, like revisiting this game after some time away, is the ways that the roguelike genre is can be incompatible with with card games and and actually lead to or perhaps cover up worse game design right because Hmm. one of the things about roguelikes where your character is just supposed to get more and more powerful is like um one of the ways to think about that is that just as the game goes on it makes it more and more possible for poor players to beat the game, right? You're going to give them more and more tools until even a weak player, a player who's weak strategically or weak at you know hand-eye coordination, if that's how the game mechanic works in, in the roguelike, uh, can can beat it because they'll have the biggest sword or whatever, yeah. right? But it's always possible in those roguelike action games to be a level one character who's just really really skilled. Right, there are Elden Ring runs where like a level one character can go and and beat the final boss. But you know, in these like, see, sometimes I would play this game, Slay the Spire, and be like, well, I'm just like I'm 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 bored. I'm done. Like there was yeah. nothing I I could have done. I just need to play this game, game ten times to get a good enough deck. And I think even if I had been the most skilled player in the world, I don't think that you can beat all the runs with a basic deck, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's two points there. This is a real pet peeve of mine in roguelikes, like Rogue Legacy was one of the games that I saw that did this early on in the like roguelike, non-roguelike meta. And for folks who don't know, what a roguelike is, is a game inspired by Rogue, which was an ASCII art top-down dungeon crawling game with randomized levels and more like a traditional Dungeons and Dragons RPG kind of theme. And then what people call roguelikes originally were other dungeon crawling ASCII art randomized games, or they people would call them, uh, what is it, procedurally generated death labyrinths was like another term. But, but then it got into making platformer games and card games and every other kind of game that had usually the idea of one life and random run generation is kind of And some kind of combinatoric mechanics were kind of like the things that now have come to be called roguelikes. Some people call them roguelites, whatever. But yeah, I hate that kind of rogue legacy style of where you can just grind. To me, that is like extremely a violation of what roguelikes are supposed to be about, which is building your knowledge of the whole system as opposed to building knowledge of any one Uh, run like you can't memorize a game like this you have to understand how the system works and all its parts interlock and probabilities and statistics in order to play well and if you can just grind to like slowly level up your character I feel like that really uh, undercuts it and and just waters it down personally well but then that that's an interesting an interesting point um and I don't know that I have like a, a philosophical position on that. Um, I'd have to think about it more. But I, how do you feel about the idea that games should be beatable on like in a completely underpowered playthrough? Like you can beat Super Mario One being completely small. Like you can beat you can yeah, beat Dark Souls. Ideally, yes. Level. I think that's actually important. Well, that's it's. Uh, skill, skill based, right? Then you're then the game yeah. is highly skill it based. Be extremely difficult. Most people should not be able to do that. But it yeah, should be a possibility. I strongly agree with that. Games, like like the Elden Ring, yeah. Melania, Naked Run. You know, I feel like that's. Yeah. Uh, I I really believe in that. 
And with, with Slay the Spire, it didn't feel like I could beat a map with the starting deck. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I wonder if you can. Oh, I guess we oh, a quick search on YouTube would tell us if that's possible. But returning to your point about like expanding, you know, expanding knowledge of the world, like I, I for me a good roguelike would be, you know, so I'm I'm gonna think about Haiti as the action roguelike that I think has become pretty archetypal and very celebrated. It embodies all the mechanics you just described. We're going to generate random levels for you every time you die. But when you die, you're going to go back into this similar but unique random level with a new tool, with a new set of tools, right? And theoretically, you can beat... I'm, I, I, I truly believe that a skilled player could probably beat that whole game without ever powering up. But... The added gameplay elements you get um, every every run through, they just give you more creative ways to interact with the world. They give you mechanics that are not just useful if you are not a world class Hades player and you know it is not in your skill level to beat it to completely unleveled. Okay, we will make it a little bit easier for you, so it will be that grind element. But the new mechanics you're learning are also like fun and innovative and creative and give you a new way to play the game, a new way to interact with the world. So it's not just about making the game easier every time through, it's about giving you a different qualitative experience every time through. Yeah, I think that's important. They're, what they're doing is they're kind of like simultaneously expanding the space to explore uh, and um, modulating the difficulty. So to me that's um, that kind of works okay for me, you know, because it's like there's new stuff to learn, but we're not just, uh, you're not just gr grinding the player's power inexorably upward. Yeah. Travis, do we still have Travis? Yeah, I'm here. I've just, I've been listening. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, th I'm, th I'm thinking about um, kind of adjacent to this, like, uh, Hades made this like smart decision of like its setting, right? Of like, mm -hmm. of and that so many of these games kind of uh, end up being high fantasy, uh, dungeon monster, uh, sword shield, and that much like I, you know how it, there is a, a point early on, like a decade ago, where it was just annoying how much zombie kind of yeah. <laughs> related properties there were, you know, th in some ways like Dungeons and Dragons is exactly my shit. So I don't feel it the same way, but I imagine there are a lot of people that are annoyed with this kind of style, the way that I was annoyed with zombies. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, and I wonder if like how much of how these mechanics might work with other things like in the Bellatro, right. It's just stripping it all out. And it's like, we're back in video poker. We're at where mm -hmm. we've, and and it seems like that there's there's space for these for for these mechanics to exist in maybe drastically different um, aesthetics um, and, and tones. Um, I, I'm I'm just feeling that really strongly now, watching Slay the Spire and and thinking of its connection to Hearthstone and um, and all. Yeah, and, and just how it looks and the aspects of this design, like the, the illustrations that I'm not vibing with right now. Um, it's funny, the, the, the art style in this, I don't mean to be mean, but is, I feel like, one of the weakest, the, the, or not even the art style, but the execution of the illustrations is one of the weakest parts of the game. It looks, it's I all agree. a little clunky and amateurish, which is funny because I had a very... This is kind of like, I had a very early reaction. I was like, oh, this doesn't look good. Uh, and then it became one of my favorite games. So that's, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Mitch, you're gargling for me. That was exactly Describe. I think you're saying you you roboted a little bit, but oh, saying, it, describing it as amateurish is warranted. You said. I just said I agree with you. Yeah, 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 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel like the theme part is an interesting one, Travis. Uh, I also am, I, I can totally tolerate high fantasy or fantasy themes. I mean, I think this one is kind of cool because it mixes a little bit of Asian, it's like Asian horror fantasy. Uh, so it's slightly different, but yeah, not very much. We still have like slimes and weird cultists and stuff. So it's, it's pretty basic in, thematically. Um, but I think that uh, in a way, a lot of games, I think, take fantasy just as a kind of like, it's almost like no theme, you know? It's just like, yeah, yeah. generic. It's generic. We're not interested in theme like this. There's no story, you know? It's yeah. just like, you could climb the tower and kill the boss. Well, who cares, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, which I, I kind of, I'm fine with, because for me, it's not what I'm interested in. But then I think Bellatro does that kind of even better, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. It's radically anti-theme. Yeah, which I'm <laughs> I'm a big a big supporter of. Um, although you know, I do think that theme can be very additive. Oh, that was yes, for sure. Elden Ring is all theme to me, honestly. Yes, like agreed. it's yeah. The theme and the kind of ambiance no, is I, huge. I, 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 I love theme. It's super important to me. But if you're, yeah, to me, like if you're not going to nail it, then yeah, go. Then be be radically be radically anti theme. Um, and 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 even then, right? We talked about one of our key insights about Bellatro was that it discovered what was the most minimal theme. I shouldn't say anti theme. It just discovered what was the least amount of theme, and it leaned into it with like the yeah. video poker aesthetic and things like that. It's sharp. I, uh, Matt said that earlier. There's so many sharp decisions made in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I also think that the, uh, it's not without flavor. I do think that the, the theme, you know, poker is a theme and I actually really like yeah. the different jokers and the card art and stuff. I actually like, I find it charming. And, uh, so I do think that, uh, the presentation layer like, for example, you could have a game like that. What was that minimal factory game that we were talking about? Shapes, right? Um, oh, yeah, Shapes IO. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Which really is just like, they're just geometric shapes. And that actually, for me, it, it works in that game. But it, when you get to that level, it does kind of lose me a little bit. I like a little bit of pictorial juice of some little jokers to look at or some, you know, pack art and stuff. I do feel like that actually makes it a better... Um, experience so yeah that's that's a really nice kind of counter totally to think about in relationship to that um yeah it's i, I remember having a friend explain to me that the reason the snow levels are always towards the end of games is because that's when the uh the developers ran out of time and so that like they're it's, it's easier to make a snow level like in terms of the amount of assets and everything you got to do <laughs> yeah it's empty um, it's supposed to be empty <laughs> yeah um yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, it's like I see so many kind of art direction choices happening in in uh, in all these games, right? And and I, I just I wonder like how how like I, I hope to see more of this kind of challenge of the 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 kind of settings and places these game mechanics are deployed because um, I, I just I I kind of feel like uh, developers who take that path are kind of uh, are giving themselves a little bit of an advantage potentially like in terms of making something cool. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know about, I don't know in terms of palatability or audience, uh, but just like in terms of, it feels like you, there's a lot of potential space to play with these ideas. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And also I think it's interesting and worth noting that, you know, Slay the Spire was made by a team of two, at least initially. Um, and Bellatro was made by a team of one. Right. So these yeah. are kind of whether we want to call them like auteur games or maybe that's an interesting thing to talk about as we think about, like, is it art as we come up on the end of our show? Maybe Mitch can land the plane for us. I do see these as kind of auteur games in a certain way, uh, given this kind of small team size and kind of slightly idiosyncratic vision. Um, Mitch, where do you where do you fall on that? Or did we lose him? Yeah, we're getting nothing. Right, while, while he's coming back, I with 
I was actually going to bring up that this week uh, there was a new update for Stardew Valley, mm. which is like in Eric Barone, like, you know, it made it himself for a really long time. And it's like, it's interesting because it's like, now it's not really made by just him, right? There's a team. And I, and I always want to know more of the story behind these solo or like small dev teams in terms of what that actually meant and what that continues to look like post-release. Um, I think of like vampire survivors and this kind of pivot that had to be done to like, okay, how do I, what do I do with this thing? I'm getting copied left and right. Like I need to, I need to figure out how to, oh, Mitch was there for a second and we lost him. Um, Mitch, you there? Yeah, so, sorry to cut you off. I just had some some things going on. Please continue your thought. Oh, I, I, I think um, I, I'm interested in the backstory behind a lot of the solo dev projects. Because um, on one hand, it seems like it's it's this like, Glimp, it, it 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 feels aspirational or something like I'm like oh these people did it like they they did it by themselves they but I I want to know like the other side of that which is like what happens post release and and it came up for me this week because uh, uh, concerned ape Eric Brown released a huge update for Stardew Valley a game that I put a lot of time into but I know that he's also developing with a small team or maybe by himself another game on top of this and just um, understanding. Uh, yeah, how that the life of the game after after launch. I mean, the important thing about Stardew Valley is Stardew Valley made like a hundred million dollars or something. Like, it was a huge commercial success. So I'm sure whatever I'm sure there's. Well, I don't. I'm not sure, but I would assume that there is uh, a team working on Stardew Valley and a team working on whatever is next. Uh, if he's doing two things. Um, because that was like such a big uh, commercial hit. I don't know how relevant that is, but Haunted Chocolatier. That's the next game, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's a super big topic. The the whole like like yeah, auteurship and the story of, of what happens with that. And it's actually something I meant you know that that, that we should have talked about with 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 Kojima, right? But. We'll get into it in another episode. It was actually something that came up, um, you know, I was, anyway, really interested in talking to some other art people and some other art world people about video games and dis and, and finding how often they would just talk about, they wouldn't say anything again. they say, what, what do you think about K K Kojima? You know, or, okay, so how do you feel about, and like, um, and, and I would miss some stuff because like they were talking about, about that game company and I didn't know the name of the lead dev. But that was how they referred to the games, right? Um, and I think that, you know, authorship is, um, and not just for vanity reasons, but it's an important part of the story of a piece of software being considered in, as an artwork, kind of in that mode of being approached with that, with that level. I think that we're going to see a lot more of it in the very near future. We're going to like return to the world of, you know, uh, Roberta Smith and Sierra Designs. Sierra Designs, Sierra Games. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, it, it's interesting to think about that game company. The two kind of like creative principals there were uh, Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago. And they kind of like caught lightning in a bottle. They got to, they came right out of um, game school and got a deal with Sony and made Flow, Flower, and Journey kind of all with like budgets from Sony and they were very like games with no shooting, games with kind of feminine aesthetics like and I think that they or I don't know feminine is not the way but it was like very much a counterpoint to the kind of toxic masculinity culture of like that time of gaming. And like it was like blue sky and green grass and not these like brown corridors and blood. Um, but interestingly, I feel like neither of them has kind of gone on separately to kind of be important tourist game makers. Um, like they've obviously gone on and had continued careers and, and Genova Chen, they do have another game called Air or something. But for me, it, it like very much has like blended into, it kind of feels like generic indie game. Um, even if like, I still think their early work like holds up really well, they didn't kind of like prove out as like, you know, kind of visionary auteurs in my mind. Well, 
Well, maybe we'll, uh, well, we should do, well, look, we should do an episode on them in the, uh, in the near future. But um, yeah. for right now, I'm, I'm looking out my window and the sea is calling me and I'm wondering if uh, this is a good time to uh, wrap it up. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks a lot, guys. And this uh, was fun. It was really Matt, fun. thank you so much for for like taking control on this and steering us through. <laughs> With my, yeah, Matt, Matt yeah. thanks for uh, thanks for running the stream. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Kevin, Kevin, thank you for the coaching. Kevin, the yes. real yeah. Kevin, yeah, is, the real. Kevin is the real MVP. Yeah, awesome. All right, thanks a lot, y'all. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.